Dr. Lauren Varelli. You guys hear me okay? Okay, great. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you about a topic that I find to be interesting from a medical standpoint, ethical, social, and, um, and legal. So the title of my presentation is Room for Rent, and the question mark is there on purpose because by the end of this presentation, I would like you to decide if you think this truly is just a room for rent or if there's more to it. So I'd like to start, I'm going to periodically be asking for audience participation, so just shout out an answer if you have one. I'd like to start, first of all, with the cover of the New York Times Magazine from November of 2008. It states, Her Body, My Baby. So take a look at this and just shout out to me what you think. What, who are these two women? What do they mean to each other? What do you think is going on here? Power dynamic. There's a power dynamic, okay. Anyone else? Maybe some socioeconomic. Maybe some socioeconomic difference. Yeah. So these are things that I thought when I saw this as well, and actually what most readers felt. The woman in the black, well, she looks rich. She looks like she's in power, and she looks like she's the one making all the decisions. Now the woman in pink, she looks maybe a little bit tired and, and maybe like she's not in control. And indeed, this was some of the criticism that came from this article. The woman in black, her name is Alexandra. She's a prominent writer for the New York Times and the wife of a successful investment maker. She recounts in the article her long struggle with infertility, including 12 cycles of IVF, multiple recurrent implantation failures, and ultimately her decision to pursue a gestational carrier. Kathy, in the pink, is a 43-year-old woman from rural Pennsylvania. She is the, has been the mother to over 17 foster children and has been a gestational carrier once before. The article, like I mentioned, was heavily criticized and critiqued for its <coughs> transactional nature that it placed on the process of gestational carriers. And while I do think that this probably does exist, I would like to be able to show you the other sides of gestational carriers and the complexity and teach you a little bit more about this process. <coughs> you, oh, sorry. Here I have listed the objectives of my discussion. Like I mentioned before, this is a field that is vast, and so we're only going to be covering um, some brief overview, as well as details that I think pertain to practicing in the state of Wisconsin. So first of all, let's start with a couple definitions. So intended parents, these are the individuals that contract with the carrier to become the legal parent or parents of a child born through surrogacy. They're usually a heterosexual or homosexual couple, but can sometimes be an individual. The genetic parent or gamete provider are the individuals from whom the gametes are derived. So this can sometimes be the intended parents or a third party, such as an egg donor, sperm donor, or both. And then the gestational carrier or gestational surrogate, GC for short, is a woman that agrees to bear a genetically unrelated child for an individual or couple who intends to be the legal parents. An important distinction is that a gestational carrier bears no genetic link to the pregnancy. Thus, this process requires IVF. A traditional surrogate is a woman who not only carries the pregnancy, but also provides her own oocytes. This can be done through also IVF or um, intrauterine insemination or at-home insemination. This is not a practice that is utilized by the majority of fertility clinics um, due to its legal, moral, and ethical complexities, and it's not a type of surrogacy that we're going to be reviewing today. Lastly, the gestational contract is a legal contract between the intended parents and the gestational carrier. Um, the contract is negotiated by their parties and legal representation, and once it's signed, this is the contract that governs the relationship between the carrier and the intended parents during the pregnancy and after. Along those same lines, I just wanted to give you a visual representation of all forms of third-party reproduction. So classical IVF involves um, an, in, an intended mother using her own egg, um, which is 
fertilized with sperm, um, creating an embryo, and it goes back into her. In IVF surrogacy, this process, the embryo is placed into a gestational carrier, and then in, um, <coughs> and in some cases, either an egg donor or a sperm donor can be inserted into this process, so you can have as many as five parties involved in, um, in the birth of this child. So going back to our objectives, let's first start with some history and background data. So um, gestational, excuse me, sorry. Gestational carriers um, and surrogacy actually dates back thousands and thousands of years to biblical time. Some of you may know the story of Sarah and Abraham. Um, God had promised Abraham many descendants, and unfortunately his wife Sarah was infertile. And the story goes that now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And indeed, Hagar did have a child, Ishmael, and this probably should have been our first indication that traditional surrogacy was not a good idea. <laughs> Sarah never bonded with Ishmael and never recognized him as her son. And eventually she developed severe resentment and jealousy toward Hagar and banished Hagar and Ishmael to the woods. So our more modern start with gestational carriers begins in 1985. This was a case of a 37-year-old who had undergone a bilateral salpingectomy in 1972 for bilateral tubal ovarian abscesses. And then in 1982 had a hysteroscopic myomectomy followed by IVF and successful implantation of a pregnancy. However, likely due to her prior uterine surgery, she had a spontaneous uterine rupture at 28 weeks gestation, resulting in massive hemorrhage, a cesarean hysterectomy, and ultimately a neonatal demise. The couple still strongly desired their own genetic child, and they actually requested from their clinic, which was Mount Sinai in Cleveland, to consider an embryo transfer to a friend's uterus, who was a healthy 22-year-old, P2P2, with two prior term vaginal deliveries. The cycles of the two women were synchronized, and the intended mother underwent controlled ovarian hyperstimulation with clomid and gonadotropins with an HCG trigger on cycle day 10. On cycle day 12, she underwent a diagnostic laparoscopy, which is how um, egg retrievals were performed in the 80s, and three follicles were aspirated. Two were mature and one fertilized and was grown in vitro to a day three blastocyst and transferred to the carrier, who then carried the pregnancy to term. This article was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and the authors concluded that this procedure offers hope of acquiring their own genetic children, not only to hysterectomize women, but also to those with unexplained and recurrent abortion, congenital uterine anomalies, severe uterine abnormalities after DES exposure, or uterine disease and scarring that precludes successfully continuing a pregnancy to term. There is no mention of compensation to the carrier in this article. So where have we gone with gestational carriers since 1985? And the answer is up. Um, the largest data set we have looking at outcomes from gestational carriers was in a study that was published in Fertility and Sterility in 2016. This was a retrospective cohort study evaluating reproductive outcomes of gestational carriers in the U.S. from 1999 to 2013. The study included both U.S. and non-U.S. residents who were involved in clinics within the United States. The main outcomes were as follows. From 1999 to 2013, there were approximately 2 million ART cycles, and about 2% of them used a gestational carrier. This equated to about 31,000 ART cycles involving a carrier. The number of IVF cycles with gestational carriers increased from 727 in 1999 all the way to 3,400 in 2013, or from 1 to 2.5%, which is what the y-axis is on this chart. This translates to a quadruple increase in surrogate IVF cycles and translated to over 18,000 infants being born from gestational carriers. <coughs> Currently, approximately 85% of fertility clinics in the nation offer gestational carrier programs. As for the sharp decline in 2007, which you may be wondering what occurred, I actually contacted the authors of this study to ask the same question. And 
Um, the author told me that she and her colleagues have looked into this and even consulted with um, policymakers in the field of reproductive um, legal cases and could not account for this. So most likely what they had attributed this to was probably an error in um, data reporting from that year. So the trend most likely continues in, in the same direction. Um, in the same vein, the, this is the data for gestational carrier cycles with non-US residents, and it overall follows the same trend, although it's a steeper curve. And this is likely because most European countries prohibit the use of GCs, and in general, the, there is a growing number of clinics who are um, prepared to accept um, uh, intended parents from international locations. There are five or six countries that offer well-established gestational carrier programs, including the U.S., Canada, India, Ukraine, and Georgia. This study then took the data from 2009 to 2013 and did a subset analysis to more carefully evaluate outcomes from gestational carrier cycles when compared to non-GC IVF cycles. Compared with non-GC cycles, intended parents were more likely to be older, 24% were over the age of 44, 15% were non-US residents, and they were more likely to have interfaced in the field of infertility for longer. So they had a higher number of prior ART cycles, increased number of spontaneous abortion, higher number of prior pregnancies, and also live births. And the majority of gestational carriers were under the age of 35, healthy with prior reproductive success. So when they tried to also elucidate why do women or why do people choose to use a gestational carrier. And unfortunately, they couldn't get a great answer to this just because the way that the data was reported did not always require a specific answer. So when you look at this data, um, on this column here is gestational carriers, um, infertility diagnosis cycles that use gestational carriers, and this side is cycles that did not. And so 46% of the cycles that used a gestational carrier listed other as the cause of infertility. The authors then went on to actually dig through those charts and see if there was anything free texted that they could elucidate. And they found 10% had free texted male same-sex couples or absence of a female partner. Another 9% reported conditions making pregnancy unsafe. And 6% cited uterine factors that had been misclassified. The most common infertility diagnosis among couples not using a gestational carrier were male factor and diminished ovarian reserve. So what makes this an appealing choice for patients who have struggled with infertility, such as the woman Alexandra? Um, so there are higher rates of implantation, higher pregnancy rates, and higher life birth rates when you look at gestational carriers versus non-gestational carriers. However, 80% of the transfers in the study involved at least two embryo transfer. This um, translated to only a 10% increase in the risk of multiple gestation and increased risk of preterm delivery. So you may wonder why it was only a 10% increase, and there's a couple reasons. One is that not there, you will not always have both embryos or all three embryos in plant, and the other is that a significant number of the cycles not using gestational carriers are also doing more than one embryo transfer. When you compare singleton pregnancies from a carrier to a non-carrier, actually the, the carrier um, pregnancies have better outcomes in terms of um, a slightly higher birth weight and lower risk of preterm delivery, which makes sense due to the history of prior reproductive success. Um, these outcomes also generated a call to the community of reproductive endocrinologists to highly consider an elective single embryo transfer especially in the case of a gestational carrier who has proven reproductive success. Now that we have some background information, let's move on to the medical con considerations when working for a gestational carrier. ASRM has a long, um, essentially, guidebook that can help clinics um, set up a gestational carrier program and actually serves as a good resource for even generalists caring for gestational carriers. It's entitled, Recommendations for Practices Utilizing a Gestational Carrier. And these are the list of indications for use of a gestational carrier um, from ASRM, and they actually haven't really changed that much from that paper in 1985. So absence of a uterus, significant uterine anomaly, a contraindication to pregnancy, such as Turner syndrome, 
a serious medical condition that could be exacerbated by pregnancy, a biologic inability to conceive or bear a child, an unidentified endometrial factor resulting in multiple failed embryo transfers, and then they also mention that no member of the clinic or lab may serve as a carrier or intended parent within that practice. The medical screening for genetic parents is very similar to preconception counseling that we would give um, for patients we see wanting to have children. This involves a complete physical exam, a genetic evaluation with universal testing and then more targeted testing, as well as many clinics are doing expanded carrier screening, prenatal labs and STI screening, and then testing for common infectious diseases such as those listed here. Interestingly enough, um, ASRM states that if um, a genetic parent is positive for HIV, Hep C, Hep B, or HTLV, they are considered ineligible to transfer their gametes to another uh, party. However, FDA, FDA does actually not um, offer these guidelines and, and states that as long as there is informed consent, they feel it's reasonable. The medical screening for gestational carriers is similar. However, it focuses a little bit more on lifestyle and environmental factors. It involves a complete history and physical STI testing of the carrier and her partner 30 days prior to transfer, routine prenatal labs, and then um, requires that she be a non-smoker, abstain from alcohol, and other <coughs> harmful habits. So now let's move on and talk about informed consent and how do we truly inform consent for a process that has many unknowns and is a huge undertaking. <coughs> ASRM offers these guidelines to help um, ensure a form of informed consent. The first is they state that the patient must be of legal age, although ideally between the ages of 21 to 45. She should have had one prior term on complicated delivery and their um, the reason for this is that they state that a, a woman who has never carried a pregnancy and delivered a baby may not be able to truly um, understand the implications of this on her body um, and, and for this reason they do not feel that nulliparous women are good candidates to become gestational carriers. She should have had no more than five prior deliveries and three prior C-sections. She should understand the IVF process and the logistics of that and all possible pregnancy outcomes, including a miscarriage, an ectopic pregnancy, her delivery mode, a prolonged hospital stay, any infectious disease risk. And ultimately, she gets to choose the number of embryos to transfer. Um, she must also be informed of the emotional and social demands of pregnancy on her existing family, which is something I will um, get more into when we discuss psychological considerations. Next, let's briefly review um, a few of the legal complexities. Like I stated before, this is essentially a legal minefield, um, and so a lot of the laws are developed off of cases. So I, I will take this, through, I'll take us through a couple of cases to help explain. So the protection of the gestational carrier is very well outlined in this paper from ASRM, and it states that all parties should have independent legal counsel, that the gestational carrier has the right to be fully informed of the risks of the surrogacy process and of pregnancy, that she should receive psychological evaluation, and that provision of reasonable economic compensation to the gestational carrier is ethical. Now this is different than other countries because there are many countries in the world, including Canada and the United Kingdom, in which gestational carriers are only allowed to be what's called altruistic carriers, meaning they cannot be compensated aside from um, the medical expenses and the time off of work. And then the next point is that the intended parents are the psychosocial parents of any child born by a gestational carrier. And this was actually demonstrated quite well in a custody battle that was all taken all the way to the level of the California Supreme Court in 1991. So this is the case of Anna Johnson versus Mark and Crispina Calbear. Mark and Crispina were a couple with uterine factor infertility. Crispina was 36 years old with a prior hysterectomy. Um, she underwent IVF and she contracted with a gestational carrier, Miss Anna Johnson who was a 29-year-old single mother with one prior child. Ms. Johnson was paid $10,000 in two installments and all medical expenses. However, following delivery, she requested partial custody of the child and visitation rights. Prior to this case, 
parentage in the state of California had been determined by the Uniform Parentage Act in 1975. This act recognized that motherhood could be established in two ways, both by gestation and by genetic motherhood. And so with this law in mind, actually Ms. Johnson was correct. She was 50% the mother of this child. Ultimately, the California Supreme Court ruled that Crispina was the lawful mother of the infant due to her intent to parent the child prior to conception. They stated that without Crispina's intent to become the mother of this child, that the child never would have existed. The ruling stated that when one woman is a genetic mother of a child and a different woman is its gestational mother, the issue of who is the child's natural mother at law is to be resolved by inquiring into the party's intentions as manifested in the surrogacy art agreement. She who intended to bring about the child of whom she intended to raise as her own is the natural mother under California law. So establishing parentage will come up from time to time and typically um, cases are reviewed similar to this one and states will decide based on individual case law how they will go about this. There's generally three ways in which you can establish legal parentage. The, the first is by a pre-birth order, which is a court order that is um, finalized before the birth of the child, stating that the intended parents are the parents of the child and the carrier was the carrier. The second is a post-birth order, which is the same process but happens shortly after the birth of the child. And then the third is a formal adoption process where either the child is adopted from the carrier or is temporarily property of the state and then adopted through the state. So I'd like to move on and talk to you a little bit about the gestational contract, which I mentioned before. Um, I thought this was a nice visual representation of the contract and what it, what it can serve for both parties. So the first is that the contract is um, a sign of commitment and responsibility between the two parties. It also serves as a problem-solving document where you can reference should issues arise throughout the pregnancy. It also delineates the rights of both parties during the pregnancy and after, as well as financial compensation. Typically, financial compensation will involve a third-party escrow account in which the intended parents will place the money into the account and it will be um, then dispersed to the um, carrier, not involving any transactions between the two of them. Okay, so let's take a break and go through a case, see how good of lawyers you are. So um, this is a 32-year-old, this is a true case. She's a G3P2002. She's at 21 weeks and three days. She's a carrier in the United States for a European couple. She has a targeted anatomy scan at 20 weeks, which demonstrates spina bifida at S2. She goes into her MFM consult, and the MFM promptly starts to talk to her about um, outcomes, and she suggests, actually, why don't we call the intended parents? I'm actually just carrying this pregnancy. So they call the parents in Europe, and there are some issues with translation, but eventually they're all on the same page. And the MFM consultant describes um, the possible outcomes and options, including termination of the pregnancy, potential for an intrauterine surgery, depending on how low the defect is and if they can reach it, or expectant management. So the intended parents state, we don't want a defective child, and we would prefer to have an abortion and terminate this pregnancy. The gestational carrier says, well, a second trimester abortion sounds dangerous, and this sounds like this baby could be quite functional, and I don't want to have a termination. So I'd like you to just turn to your neighbor and quickly decide who do you think chooses the intervention in this case. Most people think the carrier, you're right. So 
regardless of the contractual details, the pregnant gestational carrier is the only one empowered and enabled to make independent decisions regarding any screening, testing, or procedure that may be indicated during her pregnancy. Such interventions include a fetal chorionic villus sampling, amniocentesis, multifetal reduction, pregnancy termination, and invasive or fetal surgeries. Now, the gestational contract may detail um, interventions ahead of time that the two parties have decided would be acceptable or unacceptable, but for any of you who know lawyers or have ever worked with a lawyer, you know that any contract can be breached, any contract can be broken. So while the contract may state something, ultimately the decision is up to the carrier. She, now, if she breaks her contract, she may not get financial compensation or she may not be able to work with that particular uh, service center anymore, but she is the only one who is able to make those decisions. Now to follow up on this case, they actually did have a good outcome. They jointly decided to continue to carry the pregnancy. The defect was too low to be repaired intrauterine. The carrier agreed to a um, scheduled C-section and the baby had immediate um, neonatal surgery and had a good outcome. What was that? They did. The, the intended parents kept the baby. Mm -hmm. So they did have the option to give the baby up for adoption. Um, so the terms of a gestational contract are very detailed and long, and they go through a lot of scenarios. They talk about sharing of medical information, who can be in the appointments, um, genetic screening and genetic testing, power of attorney. So both parties must designate a power of attorney should one of them become incapacitated or ill or an intended parent um, pass away during the process. They discuss pregnancy termination, selective reduction, number of embryos to transfer. They delineate some activity restrictions of a gestational carrier if there are any, and then also compensation to the gestational carrier. Um, and, and compensation in Wisconsin for a first-time gestational carrier is typically twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars, and for an experienced gestational carrier is thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars. So next, let's move on to discuss psychological considerations. So the evaluation of both parties is rigorous, it's intense, and emotional and personal. Um, so the evaluation of intended parents involves a clinical interview including history of infertility, coping mechanisms, family dynamics, home environment, or um, why they, other reasons why they may choose a uh, gestational carrier. It involves psychological testing, a home visit, and a detailed discussion regarding the logistics of the process, as well as disclosure to offspring and family members and the impact of failed cycles. There are criteria for rejection of an intended parent, which first and foremost is the inability to maintain respectful and caring relationship with the gestational carrier. Any abnormal psychological evaluation or a history of unresolved or untreated psychiatric <coughs> illness, as well as current marital or relationship instability, and the inability to agree with the carrier on the decision of number of embryos she wishes to transfer. The evaluation of the gestational carrier is similar, but also focuses more on day-to-day -day life. Um, so this involves learning about smoking and substances, environmental exposures at home, safety in the home, guns in the home, religious beliefs, occupational and financial history. It is important to note that women who are on um, government assistance are not eligible to become gestational carriers um, due to the concern for coercion. Um, and also assessing her maturity, judgment, assertiveness, history of postpartum depression, her support network, her legal history, and any motivations. There's also some relative contraindications, um, which include concerns that she, she may be using this uh, financial gains to solve some of her own infertility problems, um, or inability to identify altruistic reasons for becoming a carrier. So one of the most challenging portions of the psychological evaluation for a carrier is how do you counsel someone on anticipated behavior for an event that could have highly unpredictable outcomes. Um, and essentially a lot of this counseling focuses on their anticipated um, relationship that they want to have with the intended parents in the future and with the child and um, how they would feel about significant alterations from their day-to-day -day life in 
um, bed rest, hospitalization, a pregnancy loss, sexual abstinence, um, and then reaction to the possibility of possibly becoming infertile as a result of the process. So the majority of gestational carriers are women who are completely done childbearing for their own sake. The criteria for rejection of a gestational carrier involves very similar criteria to that of the intended parent. The first and foremost, however, is cognitive or emotional inability to comply or consent to the process. Then the second is that there's evidence for financial or emotional coercion. And this comes into play sometimes when you are using a known carrier or a family member. And then the majority of the rest of them are ones I already mentioned. Um, although they add a chaotic lifestyle and current major life stressors, which can be hard to, I think, assess. Um, and then um, any of evidence of emotional inability to separate from, from or surrender the child at birth. So what do we know about carriers and their decision to embark on this journey? And from a scientific standpoint, honestly, we don't know as much as we want. There are several small studies, um, and many of them interview surrogates after the process, but they, are, um, they have a significant dropout rate, and there is significant selection bias as well. There was a study conducted in the United Kingdom in 2003 which interviewed both the surrogates and intended parents on their experience, motivation, and emotions. The study interviewed them um, postpartum, one year out, and in 10 years for those who they could still follow. The more, majority of gestational carriers cited altruistic ideals as their primary reason for becoming carriers. And I had the opportunity to interview two carriers in, here in Madison, and they also cited the exact same reasons. The majority of women stated that they wanted to help a childless couple. Some stated that they enjoyed pregnancy and wouldn't mind carrying a baby for someone else. And then there was a small portion who wanted to help a specific relative or friend. Interestingly enough, in the study and with the women I spoke with, becoming a carrier was a long-term goal. Um, this is not something that these women decided on weeks or months ahead of time. Actually, the average amount of time they could contemplate this was six years. And the majority reported a harmonious relationship with the intended parents. At the postpartum visit, they had a depression score that was 4.8, which is considered to be low. And in the study, 32% of women at one month reported some difficulty relinquishing the child, but at one year, this had reduced down to 6%, which suggests that the grief after delivery gets better with time. However, we know that this process is not all rainbows and butterflies and altruism because if it was, we wouldn't have all these court cases to reference and you probably wouldn't need an hour-long discussion on it. So um, where are the bad outcomes and, and how do we find them? And they're, they're really not listed in the scientific literature. And in fact, the authors of, that, of the meta-analysis who pooled the results of outcomes, psychological outcomes for carriers, warned the readers and said that they felt that their, the data they had was limited by severe methodological limitations based on small sample size and selection bias. And they urged researchers to try to um, elucidate more long-term outcomes. There was an article in Newsweek in 2008 that profiled several different gestational carriers. And I wanted to read a couple quotes that I found to be particularly piercing. The first, when you go home, it's so quiet. The crash comes. It's not the baby blues. It's not postpartum depression. It's that the performance is over. I was practically a celebrity during the pregnancy, and someone was always asking me questions. After I had them, no one was calling. Now nobody cares. You're out. You're done. It's the most vain thing. I felt guilty and selfish and egotistical. Another woman recounts, when she was born, they handed her to me for a second. I couldn't look, so I counted. I closed my eyes tight, I counted 10 fingers and 10 toes, and they gave her away. I cried for a month straight. I was devastated. The second woman went on to actually start um, her own surrogacy center where she felt that she could give more appropriate postpartum counseling to women regarding expectations. So lastly, I'd like to wrap up by just reviewing what it's like for gestational carriers in Wisconsin. So on a show of hands, has anyone here ever cared for a gestational carrier? Okay, has anyone ever cared for a carrier on an antepartum stay? 
What about an unplanned mode of delivery, such as C-section, operative delivery? Okay, and maybe postpartum readmission? So it looks like all of this topic is probably relevant to a lot of us who care for these women all the time. So this is um, a heat map of gestational and carrier laws by state. Um, so the dark green states are technically the most favorable. These are states in which surrogacy is permitted for all types of parents. And uh, pre-birth orders are granted through the state, meaning the order is made before the birth of the child. And both of the intended parents um, will be on the birth certificate. The light green state, states, which Wisconsin is one, are, are mostly surrogacy friendly. And, it, and they do have some various factors or county to county differences that need to be accounted for. And in some states, there may need to be additional post birth proceedings. The yellow and orange states are states that are perceived with caution, stating that there could be unanticipated hurdles in the process. And red states either prohibit compensated gestational carriers or do not allow both parents on the birth certificate. Wisconsin uses both a pre-birth parentage order as well as a finalized post-birth order. So what this means is that the, the couples can file with the judge before the baby is born to prepare the paperwork um, for changing over the parentage. However, um, legal parentage is established post-birth in a court hearing that occurs approximately 2 to 14 days after delivery, and all parties must be present. Wisconsin also lets the majority of types of couples or individuals be present on the birth certificate, which is what makes this an appealing state. So heterosexual married couples using their own egg and sperm, both parents unanimously can be on the birth certificate. And then any other combination of couples or individuals most likely will both be on the birth certificate. So, What's labor and delivery like for a gestational carrier? And, um, and in what ways, you may notice you know someone on the slide. Um, and in what ways um, can we make this a good experience for everyone? So both Meritor and St. Mary's are considered hospitals that are friendly for gestational carriers and intended parents. The GC decides whether and how the intended parents are present during delivery, and she also chooses the hospital. This will all be outlined ahead of time in the, um, in the contract. And then hospitals such as Meritor and St. Mary's will actually make a postpartum room available for the intended parents and baby, and they will get the same postpartum cares of any other family. In Wisconsin, only the gestational carrier's name goes on the initial birth certificate. And um, on admission, the gestational carrier will have signed a power of attorney to legally allow the intended parents to care for and make decisions for the baby until the parentage order is entered by the court. And then the intended parents throughout the hospital stay provide all newborn cares and decisions, and the baby is discharged to the intended parents in all cases. So for postpartum proceedings, this is, this is where I want to wrap up, is um, that following delivery, the attorneys from both parties will file a petition to determine the intended parents as the legal parents of the baby. There's an in-person hearing about a week later, and all parties are present. So um, in this group, we have um, our carrier here, some of you may know, and um, the intended parents and the judge. And essentially, the um, intended parents state that, yes, we have intended to raise this child we intended to conceive this child, and the gestational carrier says, I have no intention to raise this child, this is not my child, and the court order is made, and um, the birth certificate is changed to show the intended parents as the official parents, and the baby is officially and legally their offspring. So um, I'd like to wrap up here, and I just wanted to first of all thank the gestational carriers who allowed me to interview them. And, tell me about some of the um, very personal details of the process, as well as um, Jeannie, who is a um, social worker with the Surrogacy Center in town, and she walked me through many of the legal proceedings. So I'm happy to take any questions. All right, what questions do we have? 
I just first want to say, and of course I have a lot to say, but first off, that was fantastic. So I think that was a great um, overview of both how complicated it can be as well as how rewarding it can be for everybody. Um, people probably know that we don't have a gestational carrier program at Generations. As you can see, it's incredibly complicated and you need sort of a really strong team who can organize it. And we've had a lot of turnover in our third party nurse coordinator. So we have a new one who's been here for three or four months. Um, it's something that I think is incredibly important and I hope that we can sort of establish more in the future. Um, when I was at University of Pennsylvania, we had a very robust gestational carrier program. And just to give you guys like another couple of examples of how it can be complicated. You know, I remember doing a screen for a gestational carrier because they would come in and we as physicians would evaluate them sort of medically and determine that she's, you know, really high risk for breast cancer. She has a BRCA mutation. And then what happens if she develops breast cancer during pregnancy and she needs chemotherapy? So you sort of have to have those kind of conversations, as you said, kind of outlined ahead of time. You know, would she terminate the pregnancy? Would she not? Things like that. We had a um, homosexual male couple who one of them was HIV positive and had an undetectable viral load. And as you said, ASRM sort of advises against it. The FDA doesn't have anything. But it, in the end, it's up to the gestational carrier. And so she decided that she was OK with it. The um, sperm was sort of specifically screened and washed, and everything was fine. But you know, you really have to make sure that everybody understands the risks. Um, so I just think it's a really interesting topic. Um, and then the only other third example that I was thinking of that's kind of interesting is all the different states and how they work. And so we had one couple who the intended parents were in Pennsylvania. The carrier was in living in a like red state. And the plan was when she goes into labor, she drives across state lines into a whatever color, green state, purple, blue. Um, but what happens if she goes into unexpected preterm labor and ends up in a hospital that is unfavorable and doesn't have these kind of laws? So it gets incredibly complicated. You really want people who understand it. Um, but I think it's a fascinating topic, and I'm glad you talked about it. Um, especially when you're sort of um, trying to navigate labor and delivery decisions that are, are um, you know, impact the woman and, and she, oftentimes they don't feel enabled to make decisions about their own body because they're so concerned about what will happen with the baby in the pregnancy and sort of abdicate that decision-making process to the intended parents. Um, and it's very difficult as a, as a physician to take care of these people. But I'm wondering if there's any um, data to look at patients that are gestational carriers um, for altruistic reasons, for like friends or family members, versus paid gestational carriers, and whether the outcomes are different or better um, in those populations, um, and whether that could guide future, like you know, Europe doesn't allow people to be paid gestational carriers versus the US, which it's a transactional um, relationship. So the, um, there, I don't think that there are specific outcomes, like looking at the pregnancy outcomes. That stud, the large study in 2016 really couldn't give us a lot of information about the carriers themselves, and that's what I think we need. Um, however, a lot of the case law urges against being a known carrier for a friend or family because of the coerce, potentially coercive relationships that can ensue in that setting. That's very interesting. I, because financial relationships can be very coercive. Right. And I mean, there is, there was during um, the earthquakes that happened in Nepal, there was a <coughs> large outcry because there were so many Nepali gestational carriers um, that were carrying internationally, and there was sort of a, a uh, bizarre response where there was the desire to evacuate these women who were carrying um, for international um, couples, um, whereas you know other pregnant women that were just carrying their own fetuses uh, were maybe not 
valued that, the same way. That piece, I, I chose to not um, present on the cross-border cross reproduction because that's an entire different um, discussion, but certainly in, in a lot of the international laws, there is um, not what, what the intended parents who are in another country think is happening in terms of payment to the carrier may not always be what it is, and it's very hard to know exactly how much of the $50,000 they're putting in is going where, even if they tell them that the carrier is getting X, Y, or Z. And there, during that earthquake, there was also an exposure of um, sort of these carrier living quarters uh, where women would go and, um, and live during their pregnancies. Um, and that was something that I, I initially considered presenting on, but I decided ultimately that, um, that it was too vast, I think. <laughs> That was an excellent talk. I noticed your, when you were going through the criteria for the gestational care, there was nothing about kind of history or you know her own medical stuff. It, it seemed to be mostly focused on psychosocial and um, obviously some very severe things. But there are many more subtle things like diabetes, high blood pressure, medical conditions, um, and it didn't seem that there was a lot. So, in general, the, the screening for the carrier is focused on someone who is considered to be fit for pregnancy. Um, and, and so they don't exclude um, case, conditions such as diabetes and obesity, but um, they sort of leave it up to the discretion of the, the clinic. But ASRM doesn't specifically state if you have diabetes or your BMI is over this, you cannot be a carrier. But the data on the carriers notes that the majority of them do not have those conditions and have normal. Anyone else? We have time for one more question. All right, well, excellent talk. Thank you so much.